Hello students, welcome to the lecture on chapter 11. This is the chapter on urology or the study of the urinary system which includes the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra which I guess is on coming up. I forgot to do a term of the day for this lecture so I apologize but I will have two awesome ones for the next lecture, I promise. So. Uh, the urinary system goes by a lot of different nicknames. It's also called the urinary tract or the genitourinary system because the genitals in the urinary system overlap in a lot of places. Uh, the urogenital system, again, um, characterizing the overlap between the genital system and the urinary system. And also it's referred to as the excretory system because that is actually the function or the purpose of the urinary system to excrete waste. Um, <clears throat> so, the parts of the anatomy, the parts of the urinary system that I mentioned before, the kidneys, the ureters, down here, uh, the bladder, and the urethra, which is the tube that, from the bladder that exits to the outside world. Um, a little trivia about the kidneys. Your right kidney is actually a little bit lower than your left kidney because your liver uh, takes up a lot of space on the right side of your abdominal cavity or peritoneal cavity so it kind of pushes the right kidney down a little bit so it's a little bit lower than the other one. <clears throat> the positioning of the kidneys which will be the first organ and the major organ of the urinary tract that we'll talk about um, the kidneys are these two pink uh, donuts right here this is a transverse section so if you take a person and you slice them right through the middle um, and then you're looking up through their feet, okay? They're lying on their back and you're looking up through their feet. So here's the spinal column, right? Here's the spine. Um, the kidneys are actually almost right alongside the spine. So a lot of people who have, they have kidney stones, a lot of times they describe it as back pain. They feel back pain, like a sharp pain in their back. It's because the kidneys are actually pretty far back in the peritoneal space. Actually, it's referred to as the retroperitoneal space. Retro meaning the back of or behind. Like if something is retro, it's vintage because it's from the past, okay? So um, the kidneys are actually located in the retroperitoneal space. So here's the liver showing you the liver on the right side. This is the would be the right kidney. Um, so the re this one would be a little bit lower. Um, <clears throat> the kidneys are shaped like kidney beans, or I guess kidney beans are shaped like kidneys. I don't know which came first. Uh, but surely the kidney beans are named after the shape of the human, or the organ, the kidney. They're also similar in color. They're like a reddish-brown color. <clears throat> um, the, a few different tubes enter the kidney through its, like, you know, middle, through its navel, I guess, of the kidney, which is referred to as the hilum similar to the hilum of the lungs where the bronchi enter. All right, the hilum of the kidney is where the renal veins and arteries enter. Also, it's where the ureter exits. So it's the sort of indentation, right? Um, <clears throat> the adrenal gland right here sits on, it's like a cap that sits on top of the kidney. It's not actually part of the urinary system. It doesn't really play a role in making urine or excreting wastes. It's actually part of the endocrine system, so we'll save that for a discussion in Chapter 14, what the purpose of the adrenal gland is. Um, but it is located on top of the kidney. In fact, adrenal means uh, on top of the kidney. Renal, reno is a combining form for kidney, so any time we say renal is pertaining to the kidney. Um... So the kidney is covered in a tough sort of capsule, and the tissue layers of the kidney can be divided into two layers, the cortex and the medulla. The cortex and medulla may sound like familiar terms to you, uh, prefer probably from the neurology chapter. Similar to the cortex in neurology, the cortex of the cerebrum, for example, was the outermost layer of the tissue of the cerebrum. Same thing in the kidneys. It's the cortex is the outer layer of the tissue. The medulla is the inner layer. Okay, um, and the medulla is 
where you find these renal triangles, the renal pyramids, okay? And that is where the nephrons lie. Actually, the nephrons span both. Um, I'll, well, I'll get to that slide in a moment. So <clears throat> the renal pyramids connect to the calyces, these sort of channels uh, that lead into, a, a, ultimately lead into the ureter stuttering a lot already in this lecture. So the nephrons, do I have a slide? Here we go. So this is showing you the cortex and the medulla section of the kidney and this is showing you a close-up of a nephron, the functional unit of the kidney. This is where all of the urine actually gets made and all of the wastes from your blood get filtered out. So these so urine gets made here in the in the nephron and goes out of the collecting duct into the calyx, the calyx being one of these little entryways, these little channels. So you have these minor calyces, the little channels that then feed into a bigger channel, which is a major calyx, which all, all of the major calyces then funnel into here, which is called the renal pelvis, this wide entryway like a foyer, okay? So minor calyx filters into the major calyx, which filters into the renal pelvis, which then filters into the ureter, okay? Um, so the nephron is this microscopic structure here that is the functional unit of the, of the kidney, the parenchyma of the kidney. This is where waste get filtered out and urine gets made and there's sort of an order to it that we're going to discuss. So there's arteries, blood uh, vessels, arteries that enter the beginning of, or that sort of form this bundle, this capillary bundle called the glomerulus, which is this little knot, this little knot of capillaries inside this capsule, if you can see it, little red knot. All right, these are thin capillaries, and this is where waste actually, all of the, a bunch of liquid, the liquid portion of your blood gets transferred into the nephron, into the glomerular capsule, also known as Bowman's capsule, which I think is becoming an out-of-date term. It's an eponym that, so the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule, same thing. So all the waste products enter the nephron there, and the... <clears throat> from the glomerulus, that knot of capillaries. So that blood contains a lot of things. It contains a lot of waste products that your body has produced as a result of metabolism. It contains urea from protein metabolism, creatinine from muscle metabolism, uric acid, dr any drugs that you've taken that your you know, body's trying to get rid of, um, etc. Okay, it also contains a lot of nutrients, um, ones that you haven't necessarily broken down yet or used or been absorbed in other cells. So electrolytes, glucose, amino acids, etc. <clears throat> and so the objective of the nephron is to keep the good stuff and trash the bad stuff. So it goes through. There's this big process of reabsorption that occurs. So all of those materials get absorbed into the nephron in the glomerular capsule, and that process is called filtration. It gets filtered in, or filtered out of the blood into the nephron. All right, then all of that filtrate flows down through the proximal convoluted tubule, this yellow convoluted, you know, it's all bent and whirly uh, tubule, and the process of reabsorption starts. So this is the process where water and nutrients get reabsorbed into the blood, whereas waste products continue on into the pro down down the tube. Okay. So the next part of the nephron is the nephron loop, which also used to have an ep eponymous name, the loop of Henley, named after some guy named Henley. All right. So nephron loop, loop of Henley, same thing. Again. The process of reabsorption continues. You continue to reabsorb water and electrolytes, and we're still continuing the process of reabsorption. So this long tubule allows for a lot of surface area 
a lot of area, a lot of time for nutrients and thing and water to get reabsorbed. And all these capillaries and blood vessels surrounding the nephron loop, that is where all of those nutrients get absorbed back into. So this last loop of the nephron is the distal convoluted tubule. All right, it's the farthest end. Um, and it is sort of, I guess, the last place for things to get reabsorbed before all of the urine that's left, the leftover waste, enters the collecting duct here. And from the collecting duct, it then flows into the calyx, okay, the calyx. And then from the calyx into the renal pelvis here, and then from the renal pelvis into the ureter. So the ureter is a long tube, it's about a foot long, and it connects the kidney to the bladder. There's you know, quite a bit of space between those two organs, so it just connects the two. Um, <clears throat> urine actually, there's actually contractions in the ureter that helps urine move along. I mean, gravity usually does it a uh, job well on its own, but just like any tubes in our body, there's usually um, peristalsis to help things along. So there is peristalsis in the ureters that helps to propel urine to the bladder. And then there's two holes or orifices where the two ureters enter the bladder. So the ureteral, ureteral orifices are holes where the um, ureters enter. So here's a picture showing you here's a ureter coming down, coming down, fuses, and there's the opening where urine spills in and fills up the bladder. So here's the two ureteral orifices or ureteral openings. So that there was a picture. This is a picture of the bladder. And <clears throat> let's go over the different parts of the bladder like most of the organs we talk about. We also talk a little bit about their basic structure and anatomy. So the bladder is it's a muscular sac, um, kind of similar to the stomach in some ways. There's some, definitely some terminology similarities. The dome of the, the dome or the top part of the bladder is called the fundus, also called the fundus. There's also a fundus. The dome of the stomach is also referred to as the fundus. There's several folds, like folded tissues um, or tissue folds in the, in the bladder that allows it to expand as it fills with urine and then to contract when it's empty. Okay, they're called rugi, same as the folds in the stomach are called rugi, which allow the stomach to expand and contract when it's full and empty. Um, <clears throat> so you can see all the muscle tissue here, all the muscle, the smooth muscle that lines the bladder. And then here's the opening of the bladder that leads to the urethra, the tube that leads to the outside world, we could say. There are two sphincters that control the bladder. Sphincters, remember, are tight, are um, rings of muscular tissue that contract and relax to open and close. So the internal urethral sphincter is right around here, and it is an involuntary sphincter. We have no control over that one. Um, and the external urethral uh, sphincter is out here somewhere. That one you do have voluntary control over. So when you know you have to pee really bad and you're really squeezing your muscles and you're you know crossing your legs together, you're really trying to keep that external urethral sphincter closed tight. The internal urethral sphincter is the one that once you finally sit down and you go to the bathroom, you kind of feel that release. That's that one. But too much information, I don't know. We're getting into a few lectures where there's going to start being a little too much information, so uh, get used to it. <laughs> um, so here's the part about the external urethral sphincter. Finally, the opening of the urethra to the outside world, what I also like to say the layman's term is the pee hole. The medical term is the urethral meatus. All right, urethral meatus, the actual proper medical term for pee hole. So the urethra has differences in men and women um, because they have different distances and organs they actually have to travel through. So in men, the urethra is much longer. Um, 
because it has to travel through it travels through the prostate and then the full length of the penis. In females, it's much shorter. So in males, about seven to eight inches. In females, one to three inches, um, because the bladder really connects right through um, to the vagina. It does not pass through any of the reproductive organs otherwise. So that's all I wanted to say about those. Yes. Oh, and in men, so in men, the urethra is actually part. It's again, we go back to that term, urogenital system, or the genitourinary system, because particularly in men, the urethra overlaps with the genital system, with the reproductive system because both semen and urine come out the urethra, whereas in females, the urethra is really just part of the urinary system. It only connects to the bladder. So this is a great summary slide showing you the order of steps in the production of urine. So you drink some water, it goes into your stomach, get absorbed into your blood, then it goes to through the through the arteries, through the renal arteries, specifically into the kidney, where it enters the nephron, through the glomerulus, that knot of capillaries where filtration occurs, into the um, Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule, which then it follows down through the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle or the nephron loop, back up through the distal convoluted tubule, down through the collecting duct, into the calyx, which then enters the renal pelvis, that sort of wide uh, hip, I guess, of the kidney, into the ureter tube, into the bladder, which then flows through the urethra, and now it's out of your body. And we call that process urination. There's some synonyms for urination, which you might hear. Micturition or voiding are both synonyms for urination. I don't know how commonly they're actually used, though. Um, so the reason, I also just wanted to call it here, that we call this reabsorption in the kidney that because we are reabsorbing these nutrients in the water that we already, originally we absorbed them from the gastrointestinal tract. We originally absorbed them into the blood then. Then we filter them into the kidney and reabsorb them a second time. <clears throat> So the kidney's main function is to make urine and get rid of waste. That is their main function. But there's some other functions for the kidney as well that are pretty important. Uh, the kidney can help regulate blood pressure because blood pressure is very dependent on the amount of fluid that's in the blood. And who regulates the amount of fluid in your body? Your kidneys do. Fluids and minerals particularly are regulated by the kidney. So the kidney can alter blood pressure based on, particularly if blood pressure is low, it can um, retain water so that it helps to increase your blood pressure. Um, if It can also help regulate the pH of your blood based on what nutrients uh, get filtered out. Um, and it also can direct the production of more red blood cells by secreting the, the hormone erythropoietin, which we talked about briefly in chapter 5, I think, which was hematology. Um, erythropoietin, <clears throat> the red blood cell formation substance, all right, the substance that results in the formation of red blood cells, erythropoietin. So there's a lot of diseases that can affect the kidney or conditions that affect the kidneys. Glomerulonephritis is just a condition of inflammation of, I uh, can't think of the word, I can just keep like brain farting this lecture, um, of the glomer glomerulus of the kidney. So I also want to interrupt myself a minute to mention that Nephro is a nut, so we talked about renal or reno being a combining form for kidney. Another combining form for kidney is nephro um, because the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. So we don't usually refer to the nephrons when we're talking about the kidney, but nephro means kidney. Okay? 
So glomerulonephritis would be inflammation or infection of the glomerulus of the kidney. Hydronephrosis is when there's actually a backup of urine. So hydro meaning water, nephro, kidney, osis, condition, condition of water in the kidney. So too much urine backed up, um, not draining properly. Nephrolithiasis is a state or condition of a stone in the kidney. Litho is a combining form for stone. So like a lithograph, I think, is like stone carvings or something. Lith, I don't know, I'm trying to think of another. A megalith, like a large stone mountain. So nephrolithiasis, a state of kidney stone, which apparently I've heard and have, thank God, not experienced because I've heard from several people, male and female, that it is way more painful than childbirth. And potentially, at this point that you're watching this lecture, I may actually know what that feels like, the childbirth part, but it's actually August right now that I'm recording this lecture, so still have that to look forward to. Anyway, I digress. Nephrolithiasis, kidney stones, very painful. And another word for stone, so litho is a combining form for stone. Another medical term for stone is calculus. So when you pass a kidney stone, you pass a calculus, okay? And here's my really bad joke, mnemonic joke. So when I think of calculus, when you think of calculus, what do you think of? Probably think of math, really hard math, right? So my joke is that's probably why calculus is so hard because it means stone. Get it? Yuck, 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 yuck. Okay, so, all right, bad joke. <laughs> okay, nephropathy. I think everyone always wants to say, pronounce these, the suffix as pathy, so everyone wants to say, nephropathy or myopathy, but it's really apathy at the end of the word. So it's nephropathy, myopathy, neuropathy, okay? So make sure you, you get that down since you're not practicing your pronunciation maybe as much as you used to be when I was quizzing you on it or when it was your homework. So nephropathy is any kind of disease that affects the kidneys. Nephroptosis is a congenital condition if you're born with your, where your kidneys are actually drooping. They're, they're positioned lower in your body cavity than they're supposed to be. Ptosis, remember, we learned this in the last chapter, is a state of drooping, okay? So nephroptosis is drooping kidneys. The treatment for nephroptosis is a nephropexy. The suffix pexy, that I'll get to in a future slide, means to fix in place. So if you have two kidneys that are drooping, then a surgeon can go in and surgically fix them into place higher up. Um, when we get to the chapter on gynecology, we'll talk about a mastopexy, the process of lifting the breasts and fixing them in place, a breast lift, mastopexy. Uh, polycystic kidney disease, this arrow is misplaced, should be... Or like this, okay? Uh, polycystic kidney disease is, uh, I think, is a, also something you're born with, and it's a degenerative disease, so I don't think that you're born with all of these cysts per se, but you are born with the potential to form all these cysts, and they form over time because it's degenerative. Um, and it's very debilitating to the kidneys and usually requires a kidney transplant. Um pyelonephritis, inflammation or infection of the pelvis of the kidneys, that chamber part of the kidney. Um, pyelo being a combining form for kid the pelvis of the kidney. Uh, different, can well, renal cell cancers, cancer of the kidney can also be treated with a kidney transplant. Renal failure can occur from a number of different things. It can occur from polycystic or the polycystic kidney disease. It can occur from cancer, from diabetes, from other and lots of things I can't even think about, from trauma. <clears throat> um, 
And if your kidneys are not functioning properly, remember the point of the kidneys is to filter out waste. So if your kidneys are not working properly, your body just starts accumulating waste products that it can't get rid of, and they become toxic and can kill you. So that's why it's important to have functioning kidneys. Um, uremia is a condition of urine in the blood, not to be confused with hematuria, which is a condition of blood in the urine. Now, I guess the way that I remember this is emia, the suffix emia, literally means condition of the blood. So whatever the combining form is here is what is going to be found in the blood. So uremia is urine in the blood, whereas hematuria is blood in the urine. Okay? Try to keep those two straight. Um, so those are conditions of the of the kidney mostly. So now moving on to the bladder, the other big organ of the urinary system. Um, bladder cancer can be a problem. The treatment is usually removal of the bladder or cystectomy. Cysto is a combining form for bladder because a cyst, really a cyst is just a fluid-filled sac. And what is the bladder? A fluid-filled sac. So a cystectomy is the removal of the bladder. Cystitis, cystocele, there's that cyst, cysto combining form again. Cystitis would be inflammation or infection of the bladder. A cystocele or a vesicocele, these are synonymous terms, um, are when the bladder is actually herniated into another, now I can't remember, I'm going to look it up. I can't remember if something is herniated into the bladder or if the bladder is herniated into something else. Cystocele. Hernia in which the bladder bulges through a weakness in the muscular wall of the vagina or the rectum. So we'll also talk about, I guess this doesn't... Um, so what what this ha when that happens you get sort of a the the bladder is bulging through the muscular wall that surrounds either the rectum or the vagina and this kind of pinches off the bladder so sometimes it prevents you from urinating properly. In a couple of chapters we'll talk about vesicovaginal fistula where the bladder and the vagina actually fuse. Not fuse is not the right word. It's like the bladder herniates into the vagina and also is like punctured so that you actually leak urine through the vagina, which is slightly different. Um, so that is, that's a cystocele or a vesicocele. Vesico, also a combining form for bladder because it also means a sac of fluid. Um, overactive bladder is a problem. I think it's a muscular, smooth muscle problem in the bladder walls, and it can cause incontinence. Incontinence is inability to control urination. Um, some conditions that affect the urethra, urethritis, inflammation or infection of the urethra. So a urinary tract infection can occur at any of these points. I don't know where I have that. Here it is, urinary tract infection can include urethritis, cystitis, or pyelonephritis, depending on how bad the infection is. Usually if you catch it early, it's just urethritis. It's a sort of shallow, it's, you know, in the lower part of the urinary tract. But if it gets worse, if it gets, you know, I don't want to say infected, but if it goes on untreated, it can then infect the bladder and then infect the kidney. It can work its way up the urinary system. Um... Some conditions that involve the positioning of the urethra that I thought were interesting. So um, you can have abnormal congenital abnormal positioning of the urethral meatus. So during, like in utero, during development, the urethral meatus, the pee hole, doesn't get located in the right spot. So here's my example. I've got this water bottle here, okay, and here's the spout. If this Pretend like this water bottle is a penis, okay, this can happen in... Actually, I guess it, I don't know if it can really happen in females. I don't know what the equivalent is in females. But in males, the urethral meatus is supposed to be at the tip of the penis. 
Um, but if you have epispadius or hypospadius, the urethr urethral meatus or pee hole is actually located somewhere either on the top of the penis shaft or the bottom. Epispadius is if the um, pee hole is on top. Hypospadius is if the urethral meatus is located somewhere on the bottom of the shaft. So I don't know how I don't know how common that is, and I do think it's surgically. I think that the doctors can fix it surgically. Um, but I'd never heard of that before teaching this class. Uh, some different conditions of urination. And you'll notice that a lot of these have the suffix urea. And notice that it's spelled U-R-I-A, which is different than urea, the substance, the waste product, which is U-R-E-A. So urea with an I-A is a condition of urination, okay? So dysuria would be a painful condition of urination. Hematuria, we already mentioned, a bloody condition of urination. Anuria, without, a condition of without urinating, so not producing urine. Oliguria, oligo means scanty or few, so not producing a lot of urine. Bacteria, if I said that correctly, is what you would be having if you had a urinary tract infection and you had bacteria in the urine. Normally urine is sterile. Uh, feces, a totally different matter. Your entire gastrointestinal tract is colonized with bacteria, good bacteria, healthy bacteria. And so your feces are full of bacteria, and that's normal. Um, but your urine, the urinary tract is a sterile environment, and urine is typically sterile. And the only bacteria you find in it is occasionally, like, if bacteria from your skin gets into um, the urine. Otherwise, bacteria in the urine is a sign of an infection. Pyuria would be condition of pus in the urine, again, as a result of a urinary tract infection. Different types of nutrients that can be found in the urine can be indicators of different conditions. So again, remember the point of the urinary tract is to excrete waste but to reabsorb the nutrients. So if your kidneys are, if, if nutrients are not being properly reabsorbed in the kidney, they're gonna come out in the urine and that's gonna give medical professionals clues as to, you know, some underlying disorder. So glyce glycos glycosuria is a condition of glucose in the blood. Usually you reabsorb glucose and use it for energy or store it for later. Um, but people who have very high blood glucose levels, who have trouble regulating their glucose levels, will start excreting that excess glucose, that excess blood glucose, in the urine. So diabetics pretty much diabetes. Hypokalemia, not so sure why it's on this slide because it's not actually a urinary, pro it's not a problem with urine, it's probably more should go with the kidney because, so hypokalemia, a condition of the blood where you have too little kalo, it stands for potassium, K being the chemical symbol for, for potassium, the now I don't I don't remember the Latin name for the original Latin name for potassium was like kalium or something. So hypokalemia means a condition of low potassium in the blood. This is very rare to see low potassium in the blood from like not eating enough potassium. Most of the time that you have low blood potassium, it's because there's something wrong with your kidneys. They're not filtering properly and they're not reabsorbing the potassium properly. So it's usually a sign of kidney disease. Ketonuria is a condition of ketones in the blood. Ketones come from fat breakdown, breaking down fat. This is a normal thing. Most people break down, you break down fat all the time. You're breaking down fat right now while you're sitting there watching this lecture. Um, but people who have very excessive fat breakdown, they do it because their body's not able to break down glucose. So glucose is the first the first source of energy that the body breaks down and then sort of a secondary source is fat. People who can't break down glucose because they're not taking it into their cells because they're diabetic per se, they will start breaking down fat like crazy and it 
causes um, an excess of ketone production, and that can be seen in the blood. So glycosuria and ketonuria, gly glucose and ketones are two things that you would look for in the urine um, if you're thinking somebody might be diabetic. Albinuria or proteinuria is also, it's also very rare to find lots of protein in the urine because if the kidney is doing its job, it's retaining all of the protein to use it for your body. It's a nutrient that you want to keep. So if you find excess protein in the urine, it's usually a sign of kidney. Can be, it can be a sign of kidney um, malfunction. Also, proteinuria is something they look for during pregnancy. can be a sign of preeclampsia. So in prenatal visits, they test you every time. <clears throat> Some conditions affecting your ability to urinate, not necessarily the composition of the urine. Nocturia. Nocturia is, I don't think that's really a disease or a condition. It's literally, it's just a medical term that means having to pee at night. Um, so again, referencing pregnancy. Luckily, I at this at least at this point in August, six months pregnant, I haven't had that that problem where I have to get up at night to go pee all the time. But um, I I foresee it in my future. Um, the situation where you accidentally wet your bed has a slightly different name. That is nocturnal enuresis. Enuresis is a medical term that means involuntary release of urine in an otherwise healthy individual. So someone who is incontinent, incontinence is an inability to voluntarily keep urine in the bladder. So really a consistent involuntary to hold urine in. Whereas enuresis is sort of a situational inability to hold it in. So like if you get really scared and you pee your pants. All right, that would be enuresis. Nocturnal enuresis is bedwetting. Okay. Some medical procedures regarding the urinary system. Catheterization and dialysis, these are two sort of hospital procedures that can occur. Catheterization, often used like especially if you're hospitalized and you can't, you're bedridden and you can't get up to go to the bathroom or you are going to be doing surgery and you won't be able to go to the bathroom. Um, or if you are just having some kind of problems with your bladder that you're not able to urinate on your own, they can stick a catheter in, which is like a long, thin tube that goes up your urethra and directly attaches to your bladder and then collects in a bag. Dialysis is a procedure to manually filter your blood when your kidneys aren't working. So if your kidneys aren't working and you can't filter out waste, you can actually get hooked up to a machine that will act like a kidney and filter out the waste for you and then pump the clean blood back, the cleaned blood back into your veins. So you have two tubes basically into your in your arms. Um, so one pulls out blood and all these little green dots are supposed to be waste products, okay? And then in this machine, it acts kind of like the kidney, and waste products diffuse into the dialysis fluid and are removed so that then the blood is clean, and that clean, clean blood can now go, be put back into your body without, you know, waste products in it. Um, so people who have are suffering, suffering from renal failure and can't get a transplant, have to go in for dialysis. And depending on how severe the, the, you know, the renal failure is, they have to go in once a week or once a month. I don't know. I guess there's different schedules of dialysis depending on how quickly the waste is building up because of how poorly the kidneys are functioning. So um, surgical procedures to examine the bladder include is would be a cysto okay, let's try this again. Cystoscopy, a cystoscopy, a scopy, using an instrument to examine cysto, the bladder. All right. Most of the men in the class tend to wince a little bit at this slide, um, but this is what it is. It's using a special scope that has a long a camera at the end of a long tube, um, and. It, the long tube actually inserts into the urethra and follows the urethra all the way up into the bladder. So then they can look around the bladder 
to see if there's any, you know, is there cancer, is there some kind of growth, is there a blockage, what's going on. And a cystectomy would be the removal of the bladder if there is some kind of, you know, untreatable cancer or something else. Um, kidney transplantation, we've talked a lot about that in terms of if there's renal failure, or renal cancer, or polycystic renal um, disease, polycystic kidney disease. So taking a tr a healthy ki kidneys from one person and transplanting them into the sick person. Lithotripsy and nephrolithotomy are two treatments for litho, for stones, for kidney stones. Lithotripsy is a procedure to use sound waves to actually break up the stone, to try to break up the stone so that it's in smaller pieces and can be passed, just passed through naturally. A nephrolithotomy is if the stone is really large, um, or actually in my, my brother-in-law is a Navy fighter pilot, and he had a couple of kidney stones like a year ago, and he was supposed to go out, I think he was supposed to be deployed, and they actually went in and did the nephrolithotomy, pulled out the stones. He probably could have passed them on his own, but the problem is he was flying, he was a pilot, and the danger was that he might pass one while he was flying and pass out from the pain because it's, again, extremely painful. So they just wanted to get rid of them. Um, in other cases, some people just have really big ones and they just can't pass them. So a nephrolithotomy is actually to cut you open and pull out the stone uh, and remove it that way. So it's more invasive, but probably saves you some pa the pain of actually passing it. A nephrectomy would be what? Surgical excision or removal of the kidney, of the kidney. A nephropexy we talked about to fix the kidneys in place if you have nephroptosis, the drooping of kidneys. And a renal biopsy if there's suspicion of cancer, um, taking a live sample of tissue from the kidney and examining it would be a renal biopsy. So that's all of the lecture I have for the urinary tract, um, the urinary system, chapter 11. So next up is the male reproductive system. See you in a few.